To this day, his black and shriveled skin from the back of his head is still the most popular item in Bury St. Edmund's Museum. That was Lucy Worsley describing the scalp of murderer William Corder, just one of the gruesome items she encountered during the filming of her new TV series. Many societies fear the dead, and it's quite arguable that one reason for this massive cleansing of the tomb yeah. is, is to keep them in there and stop them doing anything you don't want. And that was Professor Richard Bradley on the possible theories behind the design of Wayland's smithy. Hello, and welcome to the History Extra podcast. My name is Rob Attar, and I'm the editor of BBC History magazine, which is the UK's best-selling history magazine. You can find it in all good news agents and on subscription. See historyextra.com forward slash subscribe hyphen today for subscription deals. And we also have digital editions available for the iPad, for the Kindle, for the Kindle Fire, for Google Play and for Zinio. And if you want details of all of those, head to historyextra.com forward slash digital. From 19th century penny dreadfuls and murder memorabilia to 1930s detective stories, Britain has had a historic fascination with violent crime. Our features editor, Charlotte Hodgman, caught up with Lucy Worsley, presenter of the new BBC TV series, A Very British Murder, to find out more about the reasons behind our supposed obsession with guts and gore. So Lucy, the, the series is titled A Very British Murder. Um, do you think it's purely a British obsession, this, this, this need to kind of find out more about murders of, of this period? Well, the reason I think it's particularly British is because it's linked to the Industrial Revolution, I believe. And the Industrial Revolution happens in Britain before other countries. So that's why I think we sort of have led the world in terms of detective fiction and enjoying, relishing the crime of murder. Mm. And uh, how and why did it become acceptable to be so fascinated with this topic? Well... I think it all goes back to the start of the 19th century and the ways that society was changing then. If you think about the 18th century, the majority of people were living perhaps in a country village, working on the land, and I guess that their greatest fears would have been dying of um, disease or a famine or in a war. But as the 19th century dawns, we get people moving to the new towns, to the new cities, and becoming distanced from nature, if you like. Maybe they've got gaslighting now. Maybe they've got proper drainage. They feel safer. And so they can now indulge in the luxury, if you, if you put it that way, of worrying about things that aren't very likely to happen, like being killed by a stranger. So it's, it's really a sort of part of modern life. And that's why I think we get this fascination beginning in the 19th century and going on to the present day. And do you think the, kind of the, the press had a lot to do with this as well? Uh, this is also the time, right at the start of the 19th century, when we get the first generation of working class people who've been to school and who, can, who, who have the skill of, of reading. They can read. So they may spend a small bit of their disposable income on broadsides now, which are these very cheap early newspapers. They're just like one piece of paper. To us, they look like posters, just, just printed on one side. Um, and that was the cheapest way of learning about current affairs. And the publishers of these broadsides very soon realized that when there was a good murder, a stunning good murder, as they called it, they would get a spike in sales. And that's a relationship that still continues to this day. And, and people did take this obsession quite far. I mean, your, your piece in the magazine mentions some of the objects made by the, the so-called murder industry. Can you maybe just tell us a little bit about those? Because they were, they were quite surprising, some of them. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the, the murder that has the best sort of trail of objects connected with it, I think, is the so-called murder in the red barn of 1827. And in this particular crime, a gentleman uh, is going to elope with his girlfriend and they meet up at the red barn, which is outside the village where they live in Suffolk. But instead of eloping with her and marrying her, he kills her and he buries her body underneath the red barn. Now, this is a very simple, brutish crime, and he was caught, and he was captured, and he was hanged in a very straight, straightforward manner. But somehow, it struck a chord. And with this particular crime, everybody knew the story. So you could buy um, a song sheet 
about it. You could go and see the story performed at the theatre, or even more weirdly to our eyes, in the puppet theatre. Um, and it also gave rise to all of these weird ceramic figurines, both of the murderer and the victim, and even of the Red Barn itself. Imagine having one of these on your mantelpiece. <laughs> It seems like a really strange thing to do, but actually, you can see the point of it because your guests in your living room would say, ooh, what, what's this then? And then you'd be able to say, well, this is the red barn and this gentleman is taking the lady and Annie's about to kill her. And you can see how it would, it would set off conversation. It would get your party going. And was it something that was enjoyed by all classes? Well, you, there, there is a sort of general pattern to murder, and I would say that it has its origin in this working class literature and entertainment earlier on in the 19th century. And then as we go through the century, the middle classes start to join in. Charles Dickens, for example, gets them interested in crime and in policemen and in detectives. And by the time we get to the 1860s, um, there's this explosion of, of, of detective stories, crime stories called the sensation novels. And these are often set in middle class or even country houses amongst very respectable people. And crimes like poisoning, middle class crimes, begin to sort of come to the fore as a to bludgeonings and stabbings. So it's like it, it, it sends up the social scale. Mm. And, I mean, you mentioned that this started in the 19th century and, and, and continued. Did the, uh, the World Wars have any impact, you know, the, the, the bloodshed and, and the, the amount of people that died during those? Well, when we get to the 1920s and 30s, we've reached what people call the golden age of detective fiction when it goes totally mainstream. And we're talking here about authors like Agatha Christie. And this sort of... Uh, we were talking about murder going, you know, up market. By now, it always seems to take place in a country house. It's solved by some sort of aristocratic detective like Lord Peter Whimsy. Um, but there's something very specific about these golden age stories that I think is really interesting. You don't see blood or gore or violence in them. The body's usually, you know, discovered already dead in the billiard room or in the library or wherever. And I think that's because there had just been the First World War People had had enough of, you know, real violence and horror and killing and grief. So to sort of take their minds off to provide escapism, authors like Agatha Christie have sanitized murder and detection. They've turned it into something like a crossword puzzle or even, even doing some knitting. You know, it, it sort of keeps your brain ticking over happily and your emotions aren't, aren't aroused by it. It's, it's just become a matter of the intellect. And when you, when you were researching for the, for the series, did you find any evidence of real-life murders replicating those that have been published in literature? Well, the other way around, really. There were lots of real-life crimes that um, led to uh, fictional responses. Okay. So the most celebrated of these is perhaps the, the, the crime that took place at Road Hill House in Wiltshire in 1860 that, that people really think of as the first genuine country house mystery. Only one of the 12 people who were in that locked house that night must have done it. And this crime just really sparked off the imagination of novelists like Wilkie Collins. So they're echoes of this real life crime. It was done by the, the little boy, he was, he was the victim, he was only four years old, it's a very horrific story, he was killed by his half-sister. And various twists and turns of this case were reproduced in books like The Moonstone by Wilkie Collins, or even in the best sensation novel of all, Lady Audley's Secret by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. If you've not read Lady Audley's Secret by Mary Elizabeth Braddon, you've got such a treat coming to you. It's a brilliant book. I'll have to look that out. Um, and were female murderers viewed any dif differently to male murderers? Well, there's something very interesting about Victorian murderesses, because the Victorians had a real problem, I think, with murderesses, because women are supposed to be weak, they're supposed to be good, they're supposed to be subservient. So what are you going to do with a woman like Maria Manning, who may be my favourite Victorian murderess, who bashes her lover on the head and buries him underneath the kitchen floor of her house in Bermondsey? She was called the Lady Macbeth of Bermondsey. And... Uh, <laughs> She, she was a very glamorous figure, and when she appeared in court, she was dressed in her tight-fitting black silk dress, and she became a huge, iconic figure. But people, it wasn't just the crime with her. No, 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 she was worse than that. She'd acted in an unwomanly manner, and she'd taken a lover, and she'd been financially and sexually ambitious, and she got tarred with all of these extra sort of layers of misdemeanor. Uh, and from our point of view, well, we don't condone her, but it was a sneaking bit of admiration. She didn't take it quietly as well. When the 
sentence was passed on her, she stood up and she she let it fly. She yelled at the judge. And that's the scene that I recreate in, in, in the show. And I really enjoyed doing it. <laughs> <laughs> it was brilliant. <laughs> but, I mean, as you're saying, some people did have a sort of grudging admiration for some of these, these murderers. What made people connect with certain murderers and not others? Well... Another Victorian murderess was Florence Bravo. Now, she was never found guilty, okay? Uh, I, I, I shouldn't even call her a murderess. It wasn't, it wasn't proven. But everybody who's looked at this crime has thought, mm, she probably did do it. But uh, she got away with it. And I think that's partly because all the people involved in the case, the policemen, the lawyers, um, they couldn't believe that this young, beautiful, rich, middle class, upper middle class woman had done it. They just couldn't, they didn't match up with their image of, of who she was. And when she had her day in court, she was able to give her defense about how cruel her husband had been to her, how he'd um, been violent and, and alcoholic. And she said things like, he should not have treated me that way. And for Victorian women hearing um, her say that in public or reading about it in the newspapers, these women accused of crimes were sometimes giving voice to something that struck a chord with a lot of other women who didn't dare say it. And do you think the rise of this murder entertainment industry meant that people became sort of almost numbed to the, the um, murders that were actually taking place? Mm, that's a really interesting question i don't think i don't think so um but when we were investigating these these real life crimes it was always with a sense of of guilt really there were real people real tragedies at the heart of all of this but that's what gives the art and the literature which they lead to its piquancy i suppose that's what makes it bite that's why that's what sort of moves you about about it um and certainly when today when if you watch a Victorian theatrical performance like a melodrama. Sometimes these melodramas tell the tale of real life murders like Murder in the Red Barn. And today to us, they seem funny. They seem, you know, ridiculously naive and, and laughable. But Victorian audiences took them really seriously. If you went to see a melodrama at a theatre and you watched the crime unfold and then you saw the murderer punished at the end, the audience would cheer. They let out their feelings. And actually, um, they found it both terrifying and then satisfying when the murderer was caught. And it gave a sense of communal catharsis. So to the Victorians, it wasn't all a joke like it appears to us. And do you think this obsession with murder had any real impact on people's everyday lives? I mean, did people come, become more suspicious or wary of other people? Mm. Well, it, it's sad to say it, but, but um, all those things that, that make up civilization like uh, hygiene and chemicals to destroy bugs, and particularly the life insurance policy, a means of providing for the future of your family if, 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 if you die, they do lead to a new and modern form of paranoia. And this manifested itself particularly in the 1840s and 50s, for example, in this great fear that developed of, of being poisoned. As chemicals got more sophisticated, so did poisons. And as people started taking out life insurance policies, they also created a motive for their relatives to bump them off. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. I haven't thought of that. <laughs> So a lot of the things that the Victorians were doing to make their world cleaner and safer, and they were living in cities where they didn't really know their neighbors anymore, and they were employing servants as they got richer, but who knows who these people really were. In fact, they were creating new dangers to themselves in a funny sort of way. And this is, this is the condition of modernity, isn't it? It's <laughs> yeah. linked to anxiety and neurosis and paranoia. We're remote from nature now, and that comes at a cost. And it, and it wasn't just entertainment, really. I mean, p public executions were sort of days out for people. Um, what do you think people got from watching people being hanged for their crimes? Oh, well, this is a, this is a very interesting question. In the Georgian age, there, were all, there was already this wonderful spectacle of the public hanging, and people went along with a real sense of enjoyment. And that's because I think that they often looked at the person on the gallows and they didn't see uh, an evil person. Be and that was because the death penalty was attached in Georgian England to so many different crimes. I mean, you could practically get executed for stealing a string of sausages. Okay. So the person on the, on the gallows then was perhaps somebody who was hungry and unlucky, someone who'd stolen the sausages, someone just like you and me. Mm. But in the 19th century, the justice system gets sort of thinned out and the capital punishment is only attached to treason and murder. 
So in the 19th century, the person on the gallows is truly evil. Uh, they, a murderer is going to be a murderer, and you, you're really going to feel that they're different from you. Um, and so the tone changes. They, they become a little bit somber. They become nastier, if you like, people shouting and throwing things. And um, Dickens found it very regrettable. He found the, the behavior of the crowd to be uh, you know, despicable. And eventually people like Dickens are successful in arguing that this is not a humane way of behaving and that executions ought to take place behind the walls of a prison and not be witnessed by men members of the public and actually this is linked to the rise of detective stories because in your classic detective story you never see the hanging you don't see the retribution the criminal just disappears off the scene don't they just yeah. like just like in real life the punishment of the criminal was handed over to the authorities and what was it that made detective novels become so popular in the 1930s do you think I think that um, they they became so popular after World War. Well, a particular type of detective story became popular after World War One, and it was a more feminine, a more character-led. Lots of female characters, lots of social detail um, in the stories of writers like Agatha Christie and Dorothy L. Sayers and Marjorie Allingham and Neo Marsh, all of these female writers of the Golden Age. I think that they. They, they just struck a chord with people who wanted something light, an escapist, something that would keep their minds ticking over, and perhaps divert them from, from genuine grief that they may be feeling about the loss of their relatives in the war that had just gone. Mm. And of course, Madame Tussauds' famous Chamber of Horrors opened in the mid-19th century, um, which essentially meant that the Victorians could come face to face with murderers of mm. their time. I mean, mm. I mean, that was very popular, wasn't it? Yes. Well... Uh, the tradition of waxworks is, is much older. Mm. Um, you, well, you can see waxworks at Westminster Abbey um, dating from the 17th century. You can see some of the 17th century kings and queens. But um, Madame Tussauds set up her gallery in England in, in the early 19th century, concentrating on the French Revolution because she was French. She'd come to England um, with some of her mannequins of the figures of the French Revolution. And that sort of shaded from, from, from horror and the guillotine into contemporary horror and murderers. And yes, you could come face to face with, with those people. But don't judge those Victorians. Don't, don't think that they're worse somehow than we are. Because look at our violent computer games. We're, we're just as bad. We're just as ghoulish. Yeah. Well, I was actually going to ask you, do you think the craze for murder has died down? Or are we still as, as obsessed as our 19th century an ancestors? I think it's alive and well. It's mm. just taken on a new form. I think that there's a real line of continuity from the beginning of the 19th century to the present day. And maybe it's books or maybe it's the theatre or maybe it's horror films, Alfred Hitchcock. Maybe it's weird ceramic ornaments. Violence and blood are there in popular yeah. culture for the whole of that 200-year period. And, and when you were making the series, were there any murders or events that particularly shocked you? Ooh, well, I'm coming back to um, I, uh, well, where we where we kicked off the whole thing was in 1811, and that's where I feel the story really starts, because in 1811 there was a particularly notorious crime. It was called the Ratcliffe Highway Killing, and it took place on the Ratcliffe Highway, which is still there, in East London. So in a very crowded part of town near to the docks, a lot of sailors and strangers and people passing through. And one night in 1811, four people were killed all at once in, in, a, in a mass killing. And it was very horrific because it was a mother, a father, their baby and their young apprentice. And the reason that this crime caused such a national panic as it did is that in the previous year of 1610, out of the whole of Britain, There'd only been 15 convictions for murder. So 1810, we get 15 convictions in the whole of Britain for the whole year. 1811, four people get killed all at once in one night. It's like the volume gets turned up. It's like the whole thing kicks off. Now murder is going to be central to people's fears. And, you know, it, I mean, the series, it looks at sort of murder th through that period. I mean, in sort of a relatively light-hearted way, um, did you, did you find it hard to sort of strike a balance between, you know, these are real-life murders um, and making the series? Oh, so right, yes. It was terribly hard to judge. And when I was writing the book as well, it's really hard to, to balance, um, you know, the fun with yeah. the, the tragedy of it. Um, at one point, for example, I, when I was in the Museum of Barry St. Edmunds, I got the chance to handle, this is really disgusting, I got the chance to handle the scalp 
the murderer William Corder. He was executed in 1828, and his body was dissected and various body parts were put onto display. And to this day, his black and shriveled skin from the back of his head is still the most popular item in Bury St. Edmund's Museum. And as I held that, I felt a sense of, you know, horror. It's really disgusting. You could see his little ginger hairs growing out of the skin. And I, I also felt guilt because I was being slightly disrespectful to the remains of a real human being, even if he was a murderer. But also, I can't tell you how much I enjoyed it. It was just <laughs> fascinating. And it's that sort of weird combination of feelings that we were, we were trying to explain and explore and to understand why and how that became almost socially acceptable. Not quite. I admit this is a guilty pleasure that we're talking about here. Mm. But it is a pleasure nonetheless. And, and murders before this period, do they get this sort of attention at all or, or not? Well, obviously murders took place, um, but they weren't necessarily detected because we, there wasn't the police force. The police force that we know today was an invention of the early 19th century. Before that, each individual parish um, would have employed its own constable and its own night watchman. Um, who often rather an elderly gentleman. These are the gentlemen who appear in period dramas ringing their bell and saying, three o'clock and all's well. <laughs> and yeah. often, often they were very aged indeed. And they didn't work as a team together. They just worked in individual parishes. So one of the, one of the responses to the Radcliffe Highway murder was that people realized that policing needed an overhaul. There needed to be some sort of citywide, um, coordinated effort. But also there was this model of the criminal of, of somebody who was maybe just like you and me but unlucky. You know, there, there are figures in Victorian, um, Georgian culture like the gallant highwayman or the charismatic career criminal who repents on the gallows and all the ladies in the crowd go, ooh, isn't he handsome? You know, figures a bit like Adamant. <laughs> yeah. so, so I think that in a sense, Georgian criminals were more... <sighs> People, thought, people, you know, felt, felt more for them. And when we move into the 19th century, there's a sort of darker tone to things. That was Lucy Worsley on why Britons have historically been obsessed with the subject of murder. Lucy's series, A Very British Murder, is currently showing on BBC4. And her book of the same name is now on sale. And Lucy has written a piece about the murder obsession for our October issue, which is on sale now in print and digitally. Also in the issue, we're investigating the mystery of the princes in the tower, we're finding out why James VI and I was hunting witches, and we're questioning whether the Blitz was a needless catastrophe. You can find our October issue in all good news agents. Check out historyextra.com for more details. And now we have a short advertisement break. In his quarter of a million copy bestseller, the Secret Life of Bletchley Park. Sinclair Mackay told the story of the ordinary men and women thrown together to do extraordinary things. His follow-up, The Secret Listeners, revealed the stories behind the codebreakers, people sent across the world on life-changing adventures to intercept German messages for decoding back at Bletchley Park. Now, in his new book, The Lost World of Bletchley Park, an illustrated history of the wartime codebreaking centre, Sinclair Mackay gives an unparalleled glimpse of a lost world and tells the history of a building and the people who worked there like no other. The Lost World of Bletchley Park will be published in hardback and ebook on the 24th of October. Wayland Smithy, a Neolithic chambered long barrow in Oxfordshire, was once believed to be the home of the Anglo Saxon smith god Wayland, but was actually built as a burial structure between 3590 at 3550 BC. We sent Charlotte Hodgman to meet Professor Richard Bradley at the site to find out more about how and why Wayland Smithy came to be and about the people who were interred there. All right, so Richard, we, we're standing at Wayland Smithy in Oxfordshire. It's a rather damp, wet day, as you can probably hear from the, from the rain in the trees. But, um, so, Wayland Smithy is a Neolithic chambered long barrow, and it's, right. it's now under the care of English heritage. Can you perhaps maybe begin by explaining what a long barrow actually is? A long barrow is simply a term for a long mound, mm -hmm. oval, rectangular, or trapezoidal, and they are normally associated with human remains. Okay. Um, and this one's quite unusual, isn't it, in the fact that it's um, 
that what we see today isn't the original monument. That's right. There are two monuments, or were two monuments here, one built over the other. After a quite short interval, the first one was oval, the second one is exactly trapezoidal and very much longer, higher, more monumental. And it's the only one that uses stone. OK. And so what was the monument constructed for, that, that first monument? first monument seems to have been constructed to contain and cover the remains of 14 people. Okay. Um, the mound itself was put over the chamber, or over the burials, however mm -hmm. you look at it, some years after they'd, uh, they'd, already, ret um, they'd already decayed, they'd become skeletons. Right. So, in a sense, the mound closed the monument. It wasn't part of the original, the original burial. Uh, so, what, and that first monument, how does it differ from the, the stone one that we see today? Well, the major feature of the early mound was, was a tree trunk, which was split in half, and the bones were arranged between the two halves, which were um, about 15 feet apart, like a pair of brackets. Right. Um, so you can imagine it as sort of two D-shaped posts yeah. with the flat sides facing inwards and 14 intact bodies placed between them, probably in some type of box. So, they, oh, so, so it was, it, there was no roof or anything like that? It was, they there, were open to the elements? There would have been a roof in that the bodies didn't all come in absolutely simultaneously. One's right. laid over another. So yeah. there's probably a roof that can be taken off and put back again, but a light roof. OK, I see. Right. And is there any significance to the positioning of this long barrow? Well, um, both the original mound and this one, with the, the later one with the stones, is facing south. Right. Um, in as far as they have entrances, they would have been facing towards the morning sun, though we certainly can't see that today. Yeah. And that's quite normal. Um, Mounds of this type usually face south or east. They seem to be connected with the sun uh, rather than the moon and with the daytime rather than dusk. Right, OK. Um, so why do you think that, that second monument was actually deemed necessary to be built over that first one? Well, I think the most important thing is it involves far more labour, it's mm -hmm. much more conspicuous, and it uses stone. And the thing about stone is that it more or less lasts forever, that's why we can see it, whereas yeah. the, the posts obviously rotted within a generation. Yeah. So I think there was a different view about how people would be commemorated. In one case, just a mound, the post gone, even if they'd originally stuck up through the, through the pile of chalk. Here, a stone structure which, in, in terms of prehistoric perception, would always be there. OK, and so w do we know if there was a settlement nearby? There wasn't a settlement on the site itself. We do know that from excavation. Mm -hmm. And we know from people collecting, systematically collecting, uh, worked flint from plough soil that probably this is on the edge of the landscape rather than to its centre. And my view, um, people were probably living on rather lower ground around the springs. Right. Um, so this was on the edge of the landscape, but it wasn't in woodland. It was still in clear, in clear ground. And what do we know about the, the remains that were... That were um found in the original Long Barrow? Well, we only know about the ones found in the early Long Barrow with yep. the timber structure. Uh, there were 14 intact skeletons. A few bones were missing, but that's probably just because certain bones of the body survived better than others. Yep. And of those, the great majority were men, okay. adult men, and in one case, the tip of an arrowhead was lodged in one of the bones. Right. So that person had clearly been injured, if not killed by mm. it. And there were two other arrowheads loose among the bones, which could perfectly well be the cause of death, because obviously the bone, uh, uh, the arrow could have entered the flesh and not the bone. Um, all three arrowheads had uh, were broken at the tip, so they'd hit something before they were put there. Right. So they may, at least those people, be battle victims. And do we think there was anything important about these 14 people, that they had this, this mound, this monument built for there them? There must be. Mm. For the simple reason that 14 people could barely build the mound. They are, oh, yeah. And uh, 14, 14 people, almost all men, could not be a sample of the population. I, mean, a, I think there was only one child in memory. Right. Um, it's quite clear that small numbers of people are selected for this kind of treatment at the expense of others. And we do know the bones of a, a few bones of other people are found in different kinds of monuments at the same time. Yeah. So they're certainly not the entire population. Uh, and in terms of the labour involved in building them, there mm. simply aren't enough bodies to have built their own tombs, if no. that doesn't sound too, too strange. And just looking at the, the huge stones that, are, that kind of surround the monuments, 
Um, I, mean, I don't know how tall you'd say that tallest one is. Well, it's, it's twice my height. I well, reckon. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm six foot. Right. So it's, it's, it's very and it's fairly wide as well. I mean, how how are they transported these these stones here? Well, there are two things. One is that stones like this probably occurred very locally indeed. Right. Um, they lie all over the chalk on the Berkshire Downs, um, the Marlborough Downs, and if you look in the modern shelter belts, you'll find pieces that farmers have cleared off the field. So they haven't necessarily come far. Yeah. The easiest way to move them is on rollers. Yeah. Um, probably uh, teams, uh, uh, teams of people pulling. It is possible um, that draft oxen were used, but I, I think in terms of the spectacle of building a tomb, human labour is more likely. Yeah. yeah. And then they're put up using, using levers, ropes, um, and just, uh, and just um, human strength. And would these sort of stones, would they have had any meaning? Is there any significance to these ty- this type of stone being used? Well, in one sense, it's the local type of stone and you have, nothing, you have yes. no alternatives. On the other hand, um, some of them are, are apparently selected for shape. Um, mm-hmm. And there's plenty of folklore that suggests that stones of this sort are, are petrified people. Right. Um, like dancers who've been turned to stone because they're dancing on the Sabbath. Yeah. Now, obviously we can't know this, mm. and modern folklore has nothing to do with the Neolithic, it's too long ago. Mm. But what is interesting is that people in recent centuries have found it quite credible to identify them as people, yeah. even though they've not been shaped. Okay, and... So what were the, the sort of people who have built this type of structure? What did they, what they, what they, how would they have lived? Oh, they were farmers. Okay. Um, very likely they were more involved with farming animals than they had been, with, than they were with growing cereals. Okay. An earlier generation had certainly um, gone in for intensive cereal farming, but by the time this monument's built, that seems to have stopped, and there yeah. is more evidence of people uh, moving across the landscape, and the cattle are especially important. Okay. And is, is Wayland Smithy typical of other um, type of monuments of this, of this period? Well, yeah, I had to give you two answers. The only monument with the split tree trunk is of a kind that seems to be turning up wherever excavation is good enough. Yeah. We've now got examples in Scotland, I- in Ireland as well as England, and also in Denmark. Yeah. The megalithic tomb has a very specialised plan and is strikingly similar to the one at West Kennet at Avery, which is actually 200 years earlier than this. Right, OK. And would, would the people who built this, would they have been aware of other, other types, like the West Kennet? Oh, certainly. Um, I mean, by the time we're talking about, people are exchanging objects over the length and breadth of Britain. I'll right. give one example somewhere I've worked. Uh, stone axes from the Lake District mountains mm. are distributed from fairly small quarries are distributed throughout Ireland, yeah. Wales, much of Scotland and the whole of England. So people are regularly in contact. And of course if they're moving around with their animals, they're more likely to meet on occasions than they yeah. would be if they were all corralled into small, um, s- uh, small farmers with their fields. Okay. And what can we tell about Neolithic treatment of the dead from, from what we've, what's been found here and you know, what it looks like today? Well, I think the most important thing is that the dead suddenly become significant. Mm. Uh, after all, these are not the first inhabitants of Britain, but the hunter-gatherers um, who d- uh, precede the introduction of farming have very, very few cemeteries. Yeah. There doesn't seem to be a concern with the dead. And what we see with the beginning of domestication mm-hmm. is certain people are commemorated by monuments and their remains are treated in special ways. Yeah. Now, one possibility, and it, it's more based on anthropology than straightforward archaeology, is that farmers are much more concerned with ancestry okay. because that provides a sort of a charter for them occupying particular pieces of ground. It yeah. shows that they and their ancestors have been in a particular place for a long time and you can see that from their monuments. Yeah. Um, in terms of treatment of the dead, there's great diversity and one practice that we do know about is the taking of relics and yeah. distribution, uh, circulation of relics. Now, we don't really see this in tombs. For a long time we've talked about missing pieces, but it's usually the results of natural decay. But what we can say is there are other sites of this date, monuments, like enclosures, settlements, where we find isolated pieces of human bone, right. which are clearly not whole bodies. So relics of the dead, of particular dead, mm. are certainly passing from hand to hand. 
And where was anything buried with these skeletons that were found? Here? Well, this is, this is rather a problem. It depends on how you interpret the arrowheads. Yes, um, it's true. If you think of them as off grave offerings, mm. fine. But if, clearly, the one that was sticking into one of the men was not a grave offering. No. Generally speaking, uh, long barrows of this kind don't really have offerings. Right. They may have some animal bones from feasting, not too much else, but. Towards the end of the period of Long Barrows, in some regions, we do get graves of individuals who are clearly buried with special objects. And that's quite a short-lived thing, and it happens later than this. Okay, so they, they, they could have been feasting and, and some sort of ritual surrounding the burial of, of these people. Oh, I'm here. quite sure that would have happened. Mm. The difficulty is that we tend to excavate the monuments, and what we might really be thinking about is excavating around the monuments to see what else happened yeah. there. Uh, where that has happened, um, there are deposits of animal bone, particularly suggesting people are feasting on, mm. on, on, on beef, on, on pork. Uh, there's broken pottery that might or might not have contained drinks. Yes, I, I don't think there's any doubt about it. Yeah. It's just harder to pick up. And do we know, um, and I don't know how we'd have evidence for this, but do we know um, what these people would have thought happened to their dead? Well, one possibility is that they, they believe there is a relationship between the way the chamber um, decays over time and the, uh, and the human body, right. that the splitting of a tree trunk, which is a weird thing to do, yes, um, yeah. is, is, is some sort of re uh, reference to the natural environment. And there are places where it seems that bodies weren't put in, weren't covered over, until these tree trunks had rotted, that the rotting of the tree and the rotting of the body, decay of the body, are regarded as similar processes. Which happen together. Um, mm. which, ha which happen together. And only after that's t complete yeah. can you build a mound over the top. And the form of the mound itself, mm. some people have suggested, why is it rectangular? Well, mm. it may that's well be, that. but it's an echo of the traditional form of house that the ancestors, the real ancestors, yeah. of the first settlers had lived in on the continent. Okay. And, and what fascinates me is that the, the, the tomb itself, it was closed up after these 14 people were yes. interred there. Um, oh, sorry. No, no, uh, yeah, the, the mound was closed and then they built another one. That's right, yes. And then the megalithic tomb, where we don't know how many people were buried because it's been so disturbed, was also closed. Yes. Why? It seems a lot of effort to go to just to inter a, a certain number of people. Well, I think, it, I think it probably is that exactly that. It needs to be a certain number of people, perhaps mm. one from one clan, one family. Mm. And it isn't open to everyone. No. Um, and once you've established, if you like, a founding family within that part of the landscape the job's done yeah it doesn't mean that you might not come back um, their photography suggests in the bronze age other people are built in are buried in mounds around this um, can't see anything of them now no there are mounds that were lengthened west kennet probably was there are mounds that have bronze age burial mounds built on top of them this one doesn't so, right. in a way, you close the monument, but you can't prevent no. later generations from doing something quite different. So, later generations, they recognise the, the, you know, the, the fact that this was a special place and oh, I think so. has that sort of... You, you can generally say that these monuments are so conspicuous and carry mm. such an aura that other things happen around them for many generations. About five miles away at Lambourne, there was another barrow like this. Yeah. Well, there's a huge Bronze Age cemetery next to it now yeah. called Se Seven Barrows, which is rather ridiculous because I think there are over 40 of them, actually. <laughs> and there's a huge time gap. Yeah. But at the same time, it establishes the significance of the place. And periodically, people go back to it and continue burying their dead because that's the appropriate yeah. thing to do. Do we know whether the treatment of the dead changed during this period from what we yes. see here? Um, not so much from here because we've lost the bones, or yeah. almost all the bones from a later monument. But in very general terms, you move from the burials of whole bodies or parts of bodies as a group mm -hmm. to the burials of individuals with offerings right. to increased emphasis on cremation. Okay. That, uh, that happens pretty widely. Do we know? We have no idea why that was. Well, cremation may be a, a rite that is introduced from a completely different um, mm. part of Europe from the treatment of whole corpses, and yeah. specifically from the Atlantic, perhaps through uh, by way of Ireland. Yeah. Um, that's, a, that's a strong possibility. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, and finally, when did the when did the site become known as Wayland Smithy? Because it wasn't that at the time, I assume. Yeah. Wayland, <laughs> Wayland is the Anglo-Saxon smith god, right? Um, who who made um, the chain mail or the mail shirt, I think technically, that's worn by Beowulf. Okay. And. It, it was regarded historically as, as looking like a cave. It was associated with Wayland as, as the Smith God, okay. um, but it's obviously also had an association with, with metalwork even earlier than that, because around 800 BC, there's a small votive offering, I think it is, of two very unusual pieces of bronze metalwork. Right, now, that okay. can't be anything to do with Wayland, no. um, but it's the same notion. Okay, and some rather lovely legends, aren't there? Like if you if you bring your horse up here and you leave it leave it tethered outside the tomb with a sixpence, I think it is, yes. it'd yes. be reshod by the morning. I yes. that's <laughs> I mean, we have to remember that making metal mm. we think of as a technology, but many societies think of it as a kind of magic. Yes, and I think that's what we're talking about. When was effectively the, the same idea as Vulcan, the, the classical smith god. Yeah. And it's interesting that transformation of metal should be associated with being a god. Yeah. And just down about a mile away down the road is the, the famous Uppington White yes, Horse. Yes. Um, does that have any relation? Would it be in the same sort of people who would have built, who would have made it that? It might be their ultimate descendants. Mm. Um, curiously enough, just above the White Horse, there is another long barrow, very, very damaged, right. which was reused as a Roman cemetery, which is why it suffered so badly. Okay. The horse itself is late prehistoric. Mm -hmm. Exactly what date is, is a bit difficult to tell. Yeah. But, it, but probably, let me think, uh, thousands of years later. I think what we have to think of is, uh, is this area having a sequence of special monuments. Yeah. This one, the Long Barrow at Lambourne, yeah. the burials at Lambourne, a very early hill fort at Rams Hill, the horse, Uffington Castle, and the strange mound near Uffington Castle called Dragon Hill, which <laughs> itself always puzzles me, and I, yeah. I would make a modest bet that sooner or later it'll turn out to be the local variant of Silbury Hill at Avery. <laughs> yeah. But we, there's no evidence of that at the moment. Okay. Well, when the rain lessens a little bit, we'll have a wander over right. to the tomb itself, I think. Okay, so we'll just walk over to the entrance of the tomb. All right, so that's, um, can you just maybe describe, so as we're walking up to the tomb now, yes. what, it, what, it, what we're looking at in front of us? Well, what we're looking at here is the entrance of the, the later tomb, the stone tomb, which we yeah. can still see today. Um, most likely, the passage was no, no more than about four foot high. You would probably, to get into the chambers, you'd probably have to crawl. You couldn't right. walk upright. And when the tomb goes out of use, massive stones are erected at the end of the tomb with a stone that's clearly broken off, closing the passage. It would have been higher. Right. But the interesting thing about stones is that they... Uh, those that survive are increasing height as you get to the entrance. So the tall, two tallest stones are on either side of the entrance, yeah. and then there is this slab which closes it in between, which looks pretty unimpressive now, but it's clearly been broken off, and it may have been yes. considerably higher ones. We just don't know that. Right, so these, 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 this is, there's four really, aren't there? Yes. Four large stones at the entrance. They would, um, there would have been others. These right. are the ones that are still, that are still here to be re-erected. Okay. And then if you just walk a little bit closer to the, so we now can actually look right sort of down into yes. the tomb. How far, it's, it's now kind of blocked, the passageway's blocked, but how far back would that have gone? That is, that is the back of it. That is the back that of it. That is the back oh, of it. Okay. It's quite short. It's only yes, a very small portion of mm. And uh, there is a narrowing of the passage where there are two um, slabs coming within about a foot and a half of each other. Yeah. Um, I wonder if that was the original end of the mound, but we don't know that. Mm -hmm. um, Judging by the heights of the stones that survived, the passage was lowest at the entrance and rose as you went back. So you're talking about going back about 15 feet. Yeah. Um, but you would have to crawl. You'd have quite a job getting between those two yeah, first, quite narrow. first slabs, especially if, uh, if you're carrying a dead body. That's not, that's not even sort of half a metre, is no, it, really? No, it's not half a metre. Right. And, and you're taking intact corpses, as far as yeah. we know. Uh, obviously, the bones from this part mm. don't really survive, but that would be the normal. So it would be it would be quite an ordeal, not just in terms of the physical labour, but of course you're also carrying your dead with you. Yeah, why would it? Why would not have made it a bit bigger just for? I ease? think to, well, two two possibilities, of course. One is to protect the dead um, from living, 
yes. see the men. And the other is to protect the living from the dead, because many societies fear the dead, and it's oh. quite arguable that one reason for this massive closing of the tomb yeah. is, is, is to keep them in there and stop them doing anything you don't want. Yeah. I mean, both, both are probably elements, and it, both of them occur in folklore from more recent periods. And then you go into the tomb, and we're not going to today, it's looking rather underwater at the moment, um, but either side are two um, little kind of sort of chambered areas almost. There are almost. chambers really. Yeah. Um, there's the one we see, which straight has got part, uh, part of its roof, and that's straight ahead, and there are two side chambers. Yeah, covered by uh, two large rocks. Yes. And on other tombs like this, West Kennet particularly, you get more side chambers. Yeah. Um, this has one pair, West Kennet has two pairs. Yeah. And West Kennet is very similar because unusually it also has a straight end to the mound with massive stones closing it off. Yeah. Very much the same. It's the closest comparison of well-preserved monuments we can make. And the remains that were found in, in this later tomb, how were they arranged? We don't know. We don't know. It was ransacked by one person after oh, another because right. it's always been visible. Only a few survive, mm. um, and they were just enough to get a date, yeah. which suggests that this monument's about 200 years later than West Kennet's, which right. is so similar. Yeah. But no, we don't know. But if we can compare yeah. with other places, probably, again, they were intact bodies when uh, brought in. There's not a lot of space in there, I was just Not a lot of space, but those bodies would then decay, yeah. and the bones can be rearranged, can be, can, can be pushed aside, so they end up in something of a jumble. Right, um, okay. It's possible, yeah. though we don't know here, but some bits were taken away again as relics, but we, we can't demonstrate that. So little survives. But yeah. intact bodies, probably, yeah. uh, in the first place, and then rearrange You can get a lot of bones into a, into a space where you can't get a lot of corpses, so yeah. we're probably talking about a period of time. But of course here we don't know how many people were in the tomb. No, no. Um, it could be, if we compare with other places, it could be it could be more more than ten, perhaps as many as sixty. Yeah. I'm just trying to imagine how you'd get these bodies in there. I mean the entrance is only about four foot high. Yes, it, it's going to be very, very you difficult. To really sort of drag them through. But when we see well excavated sites, it's clear that most of the bones were still articulated. Mm. So we're talking about corpses rather than r rather than uh, skeletons being yeah. Skeleton from loose bones. And is it, yeah. And so, how um, do we know how much bigger or smaller this this is toward uh, to the earlier, the earlier? Oh, um, this, the mound is very considerably longer and yeah. higher. Um, the chamber area is comparable. Uh, mm -hmm. What we don't know is whether the numbers of, of individuals is comparable. I mean, 14 in the first phase. In the yeah. second phase, we simply can't say. Right, okay. But again, it's highly unlikely there were so many people buried here that, yeah. there were a, that it bore any resemblance of a number of people needed to build it. Yeah. It's a select few on yeah. whatever basis they're selected from, from the population. And would that, I mean, today it looks like it's rather wet in there. Would that have been the case? It would have been what, in the, the case back then, rather not it probably water would. Type. Um, it would have been. It, it wouldn't have leaked too much. No. On very well preserved tombs um, in Ireland, we, uh, it's clear that channels were actually cut above the roof slabs to divert water, so to mm. make them watertight. Mm. Um, we can't say that here, but um, West Kennet, which is reasonably intact, doesn't drip too no. much. And just looking at the stones, um, there's some rather interesting little holes and, and sort of yeah. markings on there. Are they, were they made by anybody? No, or? no. They're, no? They're com uh, the stones are a form of uh, sandstone that occurs naturally on the chalk right. um, in Wessex and has been very largely cleared away by farmers or used as building stone right, right through to the Middle Ages. Yeah. Um, the, the features in them are, are completely natural, um, but of course people can very easily have read things into them. Mm. Um, I notice some of the stones have circular dimples in them. They do, Which yeah. are very similar like sponge to... sponge almost, yes, isn't it? They're very similar to things that are actually pecked on different rocks yeah. in, in, say, Ireland or, or Scotland. Oh. So people could have identified them as having a significance. Because yeah. remember, geology as a discipline mm. is only about 200 years old, two, 300 years old. Yeah. Um, how people understood rocks in the past is going to be completely different. Yeah. And... How, I mean, when you think of this period, most people, a lot of people would think of Stonehenge yes. and stones there. Are these similar stones to that? They're the same there? type of stone. Okay. I mean, there are, um, they're called sarsens, which yeah. is a strange term. It's, 
comes from Saracen, um, okay. and they're sometimes called grey weathers because they resemble sheep when they're lying on the ground. Right, um, okay. But uh, they are, the, they are the, the same basic type of rock. They're, they're local variations, which yeah. I'm afraid I don't understand. Um, the geology of this type of rock is, is still quite controversial. Mm. But yeah, it's the same type of stone as the big stones at Stonehenge, not of course for the smaller stones that are brought from Wales. Yeah. And just looking at the surrounding area as well, we're, we're in a kind of little wooded, <laughs> we're surrounded yeah. by trees, aren't we? Um, was that on purpose? Do you think that's why this location was chosen? It's not oh, no, quite no. secluded? Or? This, is, this, is, this, is, this is mostly 19th century aesthetics. You'll find yeah. a lot of chambered tombs have groves around them. Yeah. Um, and this is much more to make them look look right for visitors. Okay. <laughs> um, in, in the north of Scotland, yeah. they, in the 19th century, monuments of this board this kind were called druid circles and the landowners would actually plant the druid groves because that seemed appropriate I see. and now the roots of those groves are undermining the monuments right that's not to say there weren't a lot of trees around no. um, the particular site of, of the tomb is relatively open although there is evidence that it got the first mound got covered with vegetation before the second one was built it had to be burnt off okay um, but exactly how much woodland there is we don't know. No. Probably rather a lot. Yeah. Um, so the, the landscape would have looked... It's fairly flat, isn't it? I mean, I, I thought it would have been overlooking uh, the White Horse, actually, or... or... It, it's a strange location because mm. it doesn't really overlook anything. No, it doesn't. Uh, whereas no. if you look at... If you go to the now very large destroyed Long Barrow above the White Horse... Yeah. It does. It overlooks the Vale of the White Horse. Interesting. This one... Um, I think is put in a neutral location, and the main thing is it's perhaps keeping the dead away from the living. Yeah. So w there would have been some sort of su superstitions around the dead at the time. I'm but sure if people went to the trouble of, of moving these enormous stones, there were all sorts of beliefs uh, about the dead, and we simply don't know what, no. they, what they were. We just know that early agricultural, uh, well, no, let's just say, agricultural societies in other parts of the world do similar things. Yeah. So, for example, a friend of mine's been working in Madagascar, where they're still oh, building right. megaliths. Really? Admittedly, some of them are made of concrete, but, <laughs> but there, people live in houses that look like garden sheds and put all their effort into mm -hmm. these huge tombs. Gosh. I mean, yeah. But that's a recent tradition. Mm. It doesn't go back that far. We've managed to climb into the yeah. into the tomb it's rather low um, be sure to hear the <laughs> so yes so oh I can see now the uh, the little chambered oh did you hit your head yes I hit my head oh, <laughs> I am taller than people were buried here yes I'm, I'm quite short so I'm not too bad but actually this the, just either side looking at these little tombs the little um, chambers they're a lot, a lot kind of they're actually bigger than I thought actually they are um, they would have held quite a lot of people mm. and of course they're but they're still accessible and they've attracted attention in other periods. It's yeah. why the, in the Saxon period this becomes associated with the smith god Wayland, Wayland rather, and uh, th there's a bunch of flowers behind me at the moment. Oh, it's little um, feathers as well. And, and you, see, you see this on a lot of tombs, mm. um, that they've been given the significance by modern pagans, um, right. which may have nothing to do with the original beliefs, which we simply don't know. No. Uh, but they're part of the continuing importance of this, of this sort of place. Yeah, we don't know if there are any markings on the walls when, when it was kind of, like you say, it's been, it's it, been ransacked so much, hasn't it? You on the, the, the walls don't appear to be carved. If they were painted, we, it wouldn't survive in this, no. in this temperature. Uh, they've not been carved, whereas uh, there are pet designs and incised designs on tombs in Ireland and in North, mm. and indeed in, in, in Anglesey. Uh, but there's no evidence of that in southern England. Okay. Oh, I don't know, we'll let you come out. <laughs> well, make a call, call we'll out make this a time. Job of it. Uh, that was Richard Bradley, Professor of Archaeology at Reading University, on location at Wayland Smithy. You can read Professor Bradley's feature on the site in the October issue of BBC History magazine, which, as I mentioned before, is out now. And that's almost all for this week. As usual, get in touch with your views on podcast at historyextra.com, and we might read out your messages in future episodes. You can follow us on Twitter at History Extra, and you can like us on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash History Extra. 
Plus, don't forget to visit our website, historyextra.com, where you'll find history news, blogs, image galleries, quizzes, and more. Next week, we'll be talking about the princes in the tower, finding out about an exclusive club in the Georgian era, and having a chat with a bona fide movie star. Do join us for that. The History Extra podcast was recorded in Bristol and produced by Jack Fletcher.